The term cultural translation really comes, as far as I can tell, from the field of what's called social anthropology in the British tradition uh, from the 1950s, when anthropologists started to describe their activity as a way of translating the other culture. Uh, when somebody goes in to write about the culture, they are putting English terms, in this case, on terms from the other culture. And cultural translation, in this sense, didn't mean the, the cultural factors on a translation, the culture, not the sociolinguistics of the language used in translations. It really did mean, and I think does mean, the way an entire culture is translated by another culture. And I think that's a useful expression for us. That anthropological tradition also had some key points that I think we should bear in mind. First, it occurred in a situation of extreme asymmetry between the cultures. There was no suggestion that the described culture and the describing culture were on the same level or the same footing. And that asymmetry seems more suited to the kinds of relations we have in our world of immigration and globalization and the mixing of cultures. Second, the lessons of cultural translation and the debates about it were focused on the figure of the translator, in this case the anthropologist. The question is, what kind of translation should be used for this culture? Uh, how should we undertake uh, the actual writing of the translation? The focus was therefore on the people involved rather than the things involved, certainly the texts as such. Now, those elements have been picked up and used within another field, uh, which is that of post-colonial studies, especially literary studies. And the term cultural translation for, for these people, for people in literary studies especially, would be more associated with the uh, Indian cultural theorist Homi Baba. In his book, The Location of Culture, Homi Baba talks at some length about cultural translation and he associates the term with the communication and inter interactions within a third space. We could understand there would be the space of the colonized culture, the space of the colonizing culture, and the third space would be that of the overlaps between the two. Uh, particularly more recently, uh, the role, for example, of uh, um, Indian Pakistani cultures within the English language cultural system. So, uh, Hobby Baba, for example, can uh, talk about the novels of Salman Rushdie, uh, an Indian born British writer. Uh, as a form of cultural translation, as operating within those two cultures, within the asymmetric frame, and operating in a way that's not constrained by what other paradigms would call equivalence. So we find those two features there, uh, asymmetry between the terms, here a significant overlap, which is interesting because translators, I suggest, tend to operate in the overlaps, and a focus on the identity of the people within that overlap. Cultural translation would bring together those terms. Uh, Homi Baba reaches the point of saying things like, translation is the performative nature of cultural communication. And this would certainly be the case in a completely postmodern world in which there are no more fixed cultures at the source and target pole. There are many, many theories within cultural studies, within literary studies, comparative literature, which have used this term cultural translation. Uh, once you reach that critique of fixed cultures, uh, once you reach that radical critique of anything resembling equivalence, 
uh, one starts to see translation in all kinds of cultural transformation. Uh, the way one generation uh, interprets the previous generation might be translation. The way we communicate our thoughts might be seen as a kind of translation. And you, you reach a very wide field. I just want to pick up on two examples which I find interesting, which might be able to speak to uh, more traditional concerns of translation. The first uh, comes from Brazilian translation theory, uh, the poet Augusto de Campos, 1978. Uh, as a translator, gives a list of his favorite, mostly European poets, and describes how he would like to translate, or does translate them. My way of loving them is to translate them, or to swallow them down, to ingest, in accordance with Osvaldo de Andrade's cannibal law. I am only interested in that which is not mine. And the reference is back to a surrealist manifesto uh, at the foundings of, of, of Brazilian postmodernity, uh, saying that the identity will be that of the cannibal who becomes strong by ingesting the strength of the other. To translate is to ingest and thereby become strong. Uh, to translate can in this way be a radical transformation of the previous text or, in, in many of the, the Campos Brothers' translations, it can be a radical literalism as, as well. That internalization of the other would be a mode of quite radical thought that fits poorly in the other paradigms we've seen, but it might fit into something like cultural translation, in that it underlies the extreme asymmetry of the cultures and the subjectivity the, the, the personal position of the translator. My second theory that I would like to compare with that is from the uh, cultural theorist and translator, uh, Gayatri Spivak. And she talks about uh, translation as a mode of enculturation, that the infant entering the world translates the world into a known system. Okay, uh, this is from a psychoanalytical perspective. And that translation process can continue throughout the development into secondary enculturation, as we learn standard languages and then other languages as well. At one point, however, uh, Spivak relates this to her more traditional uh, work as a translator and, and says the following, which I find of interest. When a translator translates from a constituted language, that is a, a normal, standardized language of social communication, whose system of inscription and permissible narratives are her own. This would be Bengali in her case. She's talking about her translations from Bengali into English. This secondary act, translation in the narrow sense, as it were, is also a peculiar act of reparation towards the language of the inside, reparation towards the language of her inside, a language in which we are responsible, the guilt of seeing it as one language among many. I find this kind of reflection particularly profound. Here, she's talking about translation from the inside to the outside, from the language which is most hers, to the languages of international communication and describing this as a kind of guilt. The pretense, implicit I suggest, in all kinds of equivalence-based translation that languages are ultimately equal on some level. For her, subjectively, there is no equality between languages. One language is in the constituted self, is that of the most authentic or perceived to be authentic expression and the other language is towards the discourse of the other. Those two theories are quite interesting. It has a lot to do with this directionality of translations. 
the cannibalistic theories translating from the outside into the inside and becoming stronger, Spivak translating from the inside to the outside and feeling guilty. I'm not too sure if one would want to call all that cultural translation, but those kinds of subjective involvement, this intimate involvement with language and communication between self and other, is something that demands to be explored, and not just within cultural studies, and not just within literary translation. And if cultural translation is a term or a paradigm, can bring us closer to that, closer to an understanding of who the translator is sociologically, in a world of immigration, and tourism, and globalization, or psychologically, in a world where people do have to operate increasingly between the self and the other, the intimate and the foreign, the embodied and the translated. If we have to think that way, then I suggest the term cultural translation is shorthand for some of the most powerful insights we have available.